Hi, welcome to another edition of Green TV. I'm Betsy Rosenberg, and I'm very pleased to be introducing you to someone I know for many, many years through the broadcast news business back in San Francisco. Harry Fuller was a news executive at a couple of stations, I believe, and uh, left some time ago to take up birding. But if that sounds like a strange transition, you'll quickly learn why it really has some roots in Harry Fuller's background. Um, so very pleased to welcome you, Harry Fuller, to Green TV. Thank you, great to be here. Let's start with the news since we are both uh, recovering sure. news, news people. <clears throat> and that is the very disturbing, devastating, eerie uh, incidents of birds dropping out of the sky or bird die-offs as they're calling them. Of course, you think of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, the birds, Nothing, nothing good. Uh, can you tell us what you think was behind there? Were, I guess there are a couple of incidents, one in Mexico most recently, and also St. Louis. There's you know, been a lot of speculation. Do they know or do you know now what caused either one or both of those? There's a great deal of sort of informed uh, analysis of both. The yellow-headed blackbird flock uh, in Mexico was likely uh, terrified by an aerial predator uh, and when you're flying in large flocks like that, the birds are very close to each other. Uh, it's not unlike a lot of eighth graders running down the stairwell at a school uh, during a fire alarm. And if somebody falls, they all, a lot of them will fall. And I, we think that's what happened with those birds. They ran into each other. Uh, they're, they're not very strong, so they're fragile. So if you break a wing or even bend it the wrong direction in flight, you can crash into the earth. So they think that's what happened there. So that was probably a natural occurrence that would have that could have occurred at any time in history. The one in St. Louis is far different. It's only one species. There is no evidence of the birds being attacked or being poisoned or and certainly not being shot at because it's in downtown St. Louis where people would witness anything like explosions. Uh, it's quite likely it's a disease because it's not attacking other birds, whereas poison would get a number of species. Uh, and crows, we know from recent history in this continent, are one of the species most um, prone to dying of West Nile virus in the early 2000s when that spread across the country. Um, it was one of the species that almost died out. Magpies, jays, and crows were dying by the thousands. Uh, I had some birders from Chicago who were in uh, Oregon and I was taking them on a trip and they made me stop so they could get pictures of two crows sitting on a barn. They lived in suburban Chicago. This was about 2003. They hadn't seen a crow in two years. They had all died out in the Chicago area. Now they've come back because crows are widespread. And it turns out like many natural populations, there was some resistance. So the resistant crows in you know rural Iowa or Northern Kentucky or whatever, repopulated the Midwest. But for a long time, all, most of the crows were susceptible, died of West Nile, and they had to slowly be replaced by the ones who could resist the disease. And West Nile, let us not forget, is probably one of the first diseases that has spread because of global warming. It used to be a tropical disease. Now it's all across North America. I believe I just saw, keeping it very current here and with the news background again, uh, that they discovered some birds on Long Island, I believe, with the bird, is that avian? Yes, avian bird? flu. Yeah. Yeah, avian, what, yeah. What is that? What is that portend, dare I ask? Well, it's, you know, it's the same. What's happening to the birds is what's going to happen to us and it is, in a sense, happening to us. Diseases that used to be limited to certain areas because of climate uh, or habitat or insects are now spreading. I mean, it is a mosquito that spreads West Nile virus, and it's a mosquito that's not native to the Western Hemisphere but now we've got it. And it's not just climate change, it's ships, it's planes, it's international trade and transportation. I mean, anybody who's into native plants can give you a long list of plants that have come here in the bilges of ships from all around the world and now infest American waters and vice versa. You know, we send our unwanted plants and animals and insects to the rest of the world uh, and they have to cope with it too. So our international trade and travel uh, is costing the native environments across the planet a lot. And then when you magnify that by the stress and the change from the climate, uh, we're looking at a lot of serious 
uh, consequences across the globe. And I know bats are mammals, right? Not birds, but of yes. course they were at the center and continue to be of the investigation of you know where we got started with COVID. And again, that's connected to humans encroachment into wildlife habitat and pushing you know the different species closer together and then humans getting involved it really seems like nature is trying to tell us something that this really is literally the canary in the coal mine yes i think nature is saying uh and a very important biologist who died not too long ago eo wilson wrote a book about it called half earth basically nature saying get back in your box leave me alone this is my planet, it's not your planet. In spite of what some of your religions and certainly your economic values tell you, this is not a human planet. This is a natural planet. And if you mess it up, you're gonna pay the price. I would suspect that we probably have a 50% chance of our species not surviving. Uh, what time frame? <laughs> uh, well, who knows? I mean, I, I think the unpredictability of climate change is astronomical. Uh, and, you know, we have trouble predicting weather 72 days out and we can measure almost everything. There's stuff that's going to happen and already is happening with climate change that wasn't predicted 10 years ago, that couldn't have possibly been foreseen. There's probably things that are going to happen that we haven't even imagined, much less predicted and weighed and evaluated. We've been talking about some of the more dramatic recent examples of birds falling out of the sky. Uh, but there's also been studies that show the number of birds, I guess it's worldwide, is steadily going down or maybe rapidly going down. I would, yes. you would know about that and what's causing it. Yes, there's a number of things that are going on. I would say there's two major directions in which change is happening. One is in the man-made world and the things that we control either deliberately or unconsciously. Uh, which is the most dangerous thing. We make decisions all the time and don't think about the consequences. I would say that's probably the most fatal flaw in our species is it's really hard to get humans to think about consequences beyond next week. I mean, I used to work for corporations and all they cared about was the next quarterly earnings. And that's why corporations are so destructive long-term. They really don't give a damn about what's gonna happen in five years. They just aren't paid for that. That's not what their bonus is based on and they really don't care. And then the other thread is nature. Nature is extremely complicated. We pretend we know a lot and we know a lot more than our ancestors, but there is so much we don't know, so much we can't measure. There are still species out there that we've never even named. Uh, and, and some of them are probably extremely important. So as climate change happens, there's gonna be two or three cause or uh, results of climate change that are going to have enormous effects both on the human controlled world and the world that is beyond our control now. And one of them is stress. There's gonna be stress on natural systems and there's gonna be stress on individuals within each species. And then there's gonna be changes that will either happen quickly or slowly. And whether a species or an individual can adjust to that is there's no way to predict. There are some species that we can look at now and say, this one's doomed. Uh, I mean, I think one of the species in North America that's either gonna get pushed way up to the Arctic or disappear entirely is a bird called the ptarmigan, which is related to quail uh, and, and other sort of wild chicken birds. It lives at high altitude. It has no, it has no built in temperature control. It needs snow. If the sun is shining and a ptarmigan can't curl up on an ice floe, it overheats and dies at 75 degrees. Now there's nothing we can do to fix that unless we're gonna start making man-made glaciers like they did for the Olympics. But I can't imagine Exxon or Chevron paying for glaciers in the, in the mountains of Colorado. So that ptarmigan, at least in this part of its, of its range is doomed. And that's just a tiny example of the stuff that we face across the globe. Wow. And there was um, a couple of years ago, maybe each of the last few years, there were a lot of birds dying in the Southwest and they yes. might have to do with all the wildfire smoke. Have they determined that? No, they haven't. And partly it's the, the, the complication, particularly when it, this stuff happens in migration. Uh, you know, let's say birds are flying at, you know, 600 feet over Reno and they uh, inhale a lot of deadly smoke for some reason. 
And then by the time they get to Las Vegas, they're flying out of the sky. They're dropping out of the sky because it's taken that long to damage. Your, nobody's measuring all that stuff. I mean, we just now have a tiny technology that I'm helping to promote here in Oregon and scientists are pushing it all over the world. Tiny, tiny, tiny little transmitters you can attach to migrant birds and then follow them 24 seven. We've never been able to do that until recent technology. Now we can suddenly say, okay, these birds slowed down when they hit Reno, they dropped out of the sky in Las Vegas. We found them dead over the Grand Canyon. We can at least track where they were and go back and look at weather records or whatever. But until recently, we haven't been able to do that. So a lot of these things, at best, it's an educated guess what really happened to these birds. Uh, in many cases, it's environmental. Uh, and because birds move so fast, particularly when they're on migration, they can go two or 300 miles in the night. So something had happened at point A, and they don't even feel the effects to point B, and we may not notice it until two days later when they're three states away. So this is really complicated stuff. And until recently, our technology wasn't even close to being able to keep up with it. So is there alarm in the birding world? And we're going to talk about that in a minute, just what is the birding world? Um, sure. Rise up? Uh, because, uh, you know, as an environmentalist, as someone who watches these signs, I find it very frightening. Yes, it is. And there are certain categories of birds that are probably paying the heaviest price right now. And I don't know that that's going to continue. In, in this continent, the birds that are in most danger are ones that tend to be native grasslands uh, that live in the open area. And there's several reasons for that. One, grassland, if you want to pave something, it's a lot cheaper to pave a meadow than it is to cut down a forest on the hillside. So we tend to build our shopping centers and put our refineries and our gas pipelines and our wheat fields in flatter, more open areas because it's just cheaper. Uh, and secondly, uh, many of those areas, because they're open, are used for agriculture. So the use of chemicals is enormous. I mean, we have uh, agriculture intense in the Willamette Valley here where I live in Oregon. And almost all these crops have a number of chemicals that are used every year. And birds that feed on the ground or eat insects or small rodents are gonna pick up those chemicals. And a lot of them are really dangerous to birds. So between what we're doing, uh, both economically and chemically, plus the climate change, these birds are in enormous pressure. How much of an impact does extreme weather have? Uh, we moved to the outskirts of Austin in 2018, and a year ago, exactly this week, we had the deep freeze, the snow pocket. Yes. I didn't see a bird that entire week. I was so worried about them. And then you've had you've had tremendous heat and drought and fires, and, yes. also, and also probably extreme cold. How are birds able to adapt to our changing climate, changing much faster than scientists had predicted? Uh, some birds can adapt if the climate change is year to year, decade to decade, but we lived through a heat dome here in the West Coast in Oregon last summer, and it killed birds. I had friends who had barn swallows nesting on their house. The mama and the babies were baked. They were killed, and so an entire generation of babies were not born in Oregon last year. Now, if that doesn't happen again for 50 years, over time, nature will recover from that. Yes. But we know from things like the El Nino on the coast of California and Oregon that severe climate events, even if they only last a few days, like the heat dome, but if they last for weeks, like El Nino, where there's no fish on the surface, and cormorants, and gulls, and fly uh, oyster catchers and stuff can't nest, you lose a whole year. Now, for most of these birds, they live longer than a year. So losing one year of nesting hurts the population, but it doesn't threaten it. But if you get a change like that, where it happens three years in a row, swallows live four or five years. If they lost three generations in a row, they would be gone from the Willamette Valley, maybe for a long time. So that's, we don't know when the next heat dome's coming. And humans are clearly the culprits with um, our yes. emissions. And given that, remember the beginning of the pandemic, it happened in our area in Austin, uh, within a week or two of everybody staying home, all of a sudden you heard birds singing louder and more of them. And yes. it was like you were in the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yes, yeah. Our human uh, activity, our daily activity, which isn't directly uh, intended to affect the rest of the world, you know, driving our cars, uh, using our leaf blowers, 
air uh, conditioners as it gets going. hotter, AC as it gets hotter. Yeah, AC, any, anything that we do that makes noise tends to force the birds and frogs and other animals that communicate outside to adjust to that. I mean, they have found time and time again that most birds won't nest near a freeway. There's too much noise. They just don't want to have to deal with that. They need to be able to communicate to their babies and to their mates, so they move away. So the more noise we make, uh, the harder it is for urban birds. Night light is a huge danger for migrants. Migrants are, are notoriously wiped out when they fly into a well-lit high rise at night. Uh, guy wires, towers, uh, even sadly, uh, some kinds of um, windmills are dangerous for migrating birds. And we need to be, we need to look at the consequences of what we do. And if we're not, if we don't get much, much better at it, we're just going to end up destroying huge numbers of species and not just birds. Um, another, something else I noticed and, and where we live in hill country, uh, there sure. is a dark skies movement. There's no lights, you know, in our development at all. Um, no street lights. Is that, right. is that movement growing? Yes. Yeah. There are even some cities now that, that have mandated lights out at night. Um, and, you know, that's just one of the many things we can do to make life better for, for uh, birds and other animals, you know, bats or, or whatever, uh, even migratory insects. I think in general, we, and it needs to happen globally. If it happens in Philadelphia or Southern Italy, that, that's not gonna be enough. We need to do this in some sort of cooperative, rational way globally. And I, I hope the next generation could do it because our generation sure hasn't. We need to think about the effects we have on the rest of the world when we do stuff. You know, mm -hmm. it's fine if company A makes a 10% profit, but what is that doing to the planet? Is it worth it? I couldn't agree more. And uh, so, so pleased to be able to, even though these are difficult issues, you know, I feel like this is, this is news, right? This yeah. is the most important news, right, Harry? Yes, that's not absolutely. Covered, that's not getting properly covered in mainstream media, but that's another story. It is getting better, but nothing compared to what it should be. Uh, one more bird question that I've had. Sure. Personally. So in our home, we have a lot of um, glass doors and big windows. Uh, yeah. We have birds that... <laughs> fly into the windows, right. crash, and some, you know, die, sadly, and, but some look like they're dead, but then a few hours later, they kind of walk right. off and, and walk Yeah, they knock, themselves, they knock themselves <laughs> what, out. What, first of all, what's going on with that? It, and secondly, is there anything one can do besides putting a bunch of bright decals all over your sliding glass doors? There's a, there, there are better ways to deal with it, I think, than the decals. We've tried the decals, and they're sort of mediocre. What's happening is the birds are seeing the reflection. Uh, in the daytime. It doesn't happen much at night, but in the daytime, there's a reflection, and the reflection is the bush or the tree or the lawn or whatever mm -hmm. is 50 feet away uh, straight out the window, and that's what they're seeing. So they think they're flying into a bush or out to the lawn, uh, and I have found the best thing to use, and it's probably available even in places as urban as New York City. There are strips of sort of plastic tape that vineyards and orchards use and they put on their trees to keep the jays and stuff from eating the fruit. And you hang those in front of your window and they dangle in the wind and they reflect and they clearly say, this is a surface. And the birds notice that and they wanna stay away because it's shiny and reflective anyway, but it's moving and it's there. Uh, and you can stick it up with push pins. You don't, you know, it doesn't destroy the paint or you can, I put it up with blue painter's tape. Uh, so you, it's easy to put up. It weighs almost nothing. It doesn't require any structural work on your house. And I find it's about five times as effective as the decal. Glad to hear that. With the what can we do about it? And, and this is a tough one because it's both the long-term effects, climate change, yeah. uh, but also and how much of a role do pesticides and chemicals play? Because they certainly do in the bee disappearing Bees yes. during crisis, and you know, Huge. just thinking, we when we were <laughs> when we were young, our parents would have the discussion about the birds and the bees, and that was, yes. that was something else. Um, this is a lot more dire. The discussion, yes, uh, pesticides, chemicals of all kinds uh, are extremely important, uh, and it's not just things that come out of bottles and sprays. I mean, the fact that we don't have biodegradable tires on the millions and millions of vehicles is a huge environmental crime. Uh, that stuff that comes out of there is killing fish. 
it's destroying lives in our streams. And as a result, it's gonna endanger things like osprey and blue heron and river otters and all kinds of other stuff. And it's because it's cheaper to make it out of synthetic material that it is to find a solution where we can make tires out of, I don't know, wood or cotton <laughs> or, come on, if we, if we really cared, we would have solved that problem there. But because is nobody is forced to care, is nobody's anyone, gonna care. Is anyone working Are, on that? Is anyone working on that? You know, I don't even know. You know, you try researching biodegradable tires and people look at you like you're crazy. But the stuff that's coming off our tires all over the planet is destroying streams and eventually it's gonna destroy life in the ocean, just like DDT did. Uh, it's just taking a little bit longer because it's not, it's not water soluble. It's tiny little flecks, but this stuff is toxic and it's got chemicals in it that leach out and it's toxic. And that's just one tiny example of how we don't look at the consequences of what we're doing. I would guess that when you transition from broadcasting to bird watching, you probably were thinking that would be a nice, calm, pleasant um, hobby. It became a professor. <laughs> I mentioned you've written three books and you have a, a tour company, Tohi Tours, uh, to take people out on bird watch expeditions. Yes. But uh, what has happened to what should have been a pretty nice, fun, happy thing to do um, over the years, uh, leading to what we're talking about right now? Take us back to um, like what what made you make that unusual turn? Well, uh, it was I, I was actually still working full time, and my uh, escape from from meetings and pressure and deadlines had always been baseball and statistics, and then the players. And the major leagues went on strike one summer and ruined my life. I mean, I, I was to the point where I'd say, if this was drugs, you'd be in rehab. Find something else that is important. And I remembered I'd been gone through a divorce years before and didn't have any money and, and took a birding class on the weekend and went out. And it was fun. It was outdoors. Uh, you know, after years in the broadcast business and the internet business, I was sick of meetings in rooms where you can't even open the window. So this was outdoors. So I started going on bird walks and I thought, wow, this is really cool. And the thing it was, it, it fit my personality, which did well with deadlines and get it done now. And birds are that way. Birds are quick, they're fast. The amount of information available about birds is probably even greater than the amount of information available in the news world. So it's, it's not like you're gonna learn everything. It's not like you know playing checkers where there's 850,000 moves and once you've memorized them all, there's nothing to learn. There's never an end of learning about birds. They teach you stuff every day. I still see them do things and I went, wow, I didn't know they did that. <laughs> and because of our science, we're now learning stuff about them. I mean, just birds migrate with a sense of the magnetic field of the world. They have a sense organ in their eyes that chemically reacts to magnetic lines and they have a vision, a visual image of where the magnetic lines are on the earth. So if they're migrating at night, the wind is blowing, it's raining, they can't see the stars and the moon, they can't smell anything, they can't hear anything except the rain, they know where they are because they see the magnetic lines of force that aren't affected by all the things that would confuse us, they can still fly due south or due north. I mean, and, it's just the more I learn about birds, the more I go, wow. Well, the, the, the flocks of birds you see when they're all together and then they do these amazing turns, I guess, certain, yeah. birds, certain times of year, certain places reminds me of, you know, school of fish. That, you That's know, right. Yeah. Like, well, so yeah. What, what's up with that? Is that what you're talking about? That magnetic? Well, it's also just knowing the direction they're going. Uh, they know they don't get lost. Uh, in the kind of weather that would completely befuddle us. We'd have to sit under a tree and wait for the storm to pass. We would have no idea what's north, south, east, or west. But they know, no matter what the weather is, where they're going because of this magnetic sense that we don't have. We have no sense of that at all. Well, and the flocks that fly, like you're talking about, like starlings or yeah. like yeah. schools of fish, they, uh, each bird in those flocks, they have done a calculation. They relate to seven nearby birds. So it's, it's, it's a flow, it's a fluid, it's fluid mechanics. They are flowing like a liquid. Yeah. They are not trying to follow everybody. They're just following the ones near them. And so it, it moves, you know, like melted butter or water in a stream. Uh, and it's completely beyond any capability we would have to even be able to try to maneuver that quickly. Uh, that's the other thing. Birds are so fast compared to us. Their eyes, their brain, their wings, their heartbeat. I mean, a hummingbird has over a hundred 
heartbeats mm -hmm. a minute, more than one and a half heartbeats per second for some of them when they're flying. I mean, it, that's just totally beyond our capability of even understanding. Okay, one last question about flocks sure. of birds before we learn a little bit more about what you do with your tours. Sure. Uh, so when you see a flock of those birds, when I, we lived in um, Marin County before we moved to uh, sure. Texas, uh, we lived at the end of the Tiburon Peninsula and, you know, like over the, you could look out and see Angel Island and that body of water there, Raccoon Straits, what it was called. Yes. Uh, yeah. you know, every morning it was like they were going to Starbucks, you know, every morning the same day, same time, and then they yeah. go back to the bar, I guess. Is, yeah. there, is there a leader in those flocks? Like, is that all random or is there a method to that madness too? I always uh, the, the method is much more social. It's not, uh, you know, one dictator and everybody follows. They tend to have shared values. Uh, birds that are, are social and often in flocks, whether it's crows, gulls, ducks, um, shorebirds, sparrows, they tend to share uh, certain knowledge and values. Uh, in some cases, the really smart birds like parrots and the people in the crow and jay family, they communicate directly. They tell each other things. But, you know, if one solves a problem, how do you get that cheese block out of that puzzle? If he takes you in the yard and puts that cheese block in the puzzle, here's how you get it out. They will communicate direct information like that to those really smart social birds. But even the less smart ones, they share certain values, certain habits, uh, and it becomes dominant within the group. But if something happens, for example, recently there was a, well, a few years ago, there was a heronry that had been the same place on Bolinas Bay in Marin County for decades and it had been protected. Eagles and raccoons started raiding the nest. They all left. They moved somewhere else. So that was a collective decision. It wasn't some king heron sitting at the top of the tree saying, okay, now we're gonna move a mile up the coast. They not just- a, Not an edict, work. not an edict from on high. Okay, then yeah. one, one last question about bird behavior sure. in particular, you hear them singing and it's such a wonderful sound, especially yes. now that we appreciate them. Yes. Um, obviously they are communicating. Um, are there, yes. I'm sure there's different songs, whatever you call them, sounds coming from sure. different species, but are they in general talking like one-on-one -on -one or is it one and others? Like just what's going on behind that beautiful, it, beautiful it's noise? Actually, you, I think you should think of bird sound, including song and music, as you do human verbal communication. It really covers the spectrum. I think it goes everything from entertainment, uh, self-entertainment or entertainment of a small group to warning, screams. I mean, if you live in North America you and you have a feeder, you know if there are jays in your neighborhood and they scream because there's a cooper's hawk, every bird is gone. It takes a second and a half for every junco in my yard to leave. The minute the jays scream and say, cooper's hawk, the junco is gone. All of them, all 40 or 50 of them. They're just, so they listen to each other. Uh, it, there's relationships of pairs. I was once sitting in Golden Gate Park waiting for a little bird to come out of the willows and it never did. And I heard this tiny, beautiful little whisper and I couldn't figure out what it was coming from. And I watched and down the path come two song sparrows talking to each other in this tiny little voice. If I had been more than four feet away, I never would have heard it. So they have all kinds of, they have the, the town crier screams that you hear from jays all the time, but jays are capable if they're sitting next to each other of whispering sweet nothings. You and I will never hear Okay. Because that's not the purpose of that community. So they have communication complexity, just like we do. So can one species communicate with another species? Yes, or and they listen. They listen. Species? The Jay example is is just the most outstanding. But they listen to each other all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, jays will do another thing. They certainly do on the West Coast. They will imitate a red tail hawk, do a perfect red tail hawk call, which scares <laughs> all the other birds away, so they get to the food. They do it on purpose. They know that all of those birds know that a red-tailed hawk is a dangerous predator. And so if they make that scream, it'll scare the other birds long enough for them to get to the peanut, whatever they're after. This is fascinating and clearly you're passionate about it. And we are <laughs> going to have you back on Green TV to talk about this. But I have to ask then, okay. what, about, what about these tours? Uh, you, you lead them. Are they growing in popularity? And what can somebody expect? And how can they find out about yours if they happen to live in the Northwest? <laughs> well, they can, they can, uh, probably the best tours I do now are at Malheur, the National Wildlife Refuge, where I work for the uh, field station out there. And we do two or three trips a year. Uh, COVID obviously interrupted all that. 
but if people want it, you can, if you want to attach my email at the bottom, people can just email me if they want tours. I've got a whole network of people. If I can't do it, I've got friends uh, who can help. Uh, I get a lot of emails now because of the book I wrote about great gray owls, people who want to photograph that bird. It's the largest owl in North America. It's hard to find, it's secretive, but I've got friends in Southern Oregon who have become owl nuts and they're willing <laughs> usually to take somebody up to get pictures of these incredible birds. Um, and so it's it's been hard because of COVID, but day trips are still really easy. You take your own car, you're not sharing anything other than standing outside looking at birds. I would think uh, so be a perfect I do a lot of field trips now and they're all outdoors. You don't, you know, sit in the classroom, you don't ride the bus. I would think it'd be a perfect thing to do that is growing in popularity just because yes. one this is one of the silver linings or green linings of this pandemic. Yes. People are yes. appreciating nature and being outdoors more and you don't have to worry about masks and crowds. That's certainly. right. That's yeah. right. So That's really, right. I'm, I'm yeah. so glad to learn about this. I wish Great. we had more time, but That's we okay. would love to talk again. Thank you so much, Harry Thank Fuller. Thank you. And we will put links to your books and your tour company and Great. people can find out more. I love your passion. I learned a lot. And um, what, I guess, okay, one last question to end on. What can people do if they're concerned about these trends? Uh, what they can do is do their best to help save trees, natural plants, open space, uh, get people to solarize the parking lot so we don't have to build 9 million more power plants uh, to, to run the planet. The fact that Walmart and Costco and all these big places had these huge parking lots that are just open to the sun that we waste, how stupid is that? The roofs should be filled with solar panels. A roof is a total right. waste, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, all that. What yep. about chemicals and pesticides? Does it matter what I use in my backyard? To the birds? Use, as, use as little as you can get by with. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, we were getting ready. We were worried. We have rose bushes where we are. The climate here is fairly damp, still hasn't changed much uh, yet. And we were worried because aphids came onto the roses last year. And we were getting ready to get ready to think, oh my God, we're going to have to do something to save the roses. And all of a sudden, there were ladybugs everywhere, and the aphids were gone within about two weeks. Ate them ladybugs. all. Ladybugs. Oh, I could ask you about ladybugs. So, thank you, Harry, for, yeah. for your time. Thank you. And your passion you. and uh, your education. It's really enlightening. Really appreciate Great. it. Great. Thank you. Okay.